My name is David Hovde, and I'm interviewing Jim Jenis uh, on uh, November uh, 16th, 2000, uh, 2016, and uh, we are here to uh, talk about his time here at Purdue, and uh, specifically his involvement uh, with being uh, Purdue Pete while he was here at Purdue. So, uh, so Mr. Jenis, uh, could you tell me a little bit about your, uh, uh, you know, where you grew up and uh, anything you'd like to discuss about your, uh, uh, before you came to Purdue? I was born and raised in Chrisman, Illinois, which is just barely across the line in, uh, down in central Illinois. I you know my, the reason we came to Purdue, my best friend and I, his parents had gone to Purdue and actually I received an ROTC four-year scholarship which paid tuition and fees so we could go wherever we wanted and I had an English teacher that had just graduated from Purdue University and he used to bring us up here all the time for ball games and stuff so we were uh, very familiar with the campus and it's where we wanted to go so we decided to come here um, I was very active in sports and everything when I was in high school and you become a uh, small fish in a big pond when you come to the university and well I participated in intramurals and all that but actually what triggered my interest in Purdue Pete was I wanted to be a member of the Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity which I ended up joining and a member of Alpha Gamma Rho for like 12 years in a row was Purdue Pete. I mean we kind of had a lock on that and my freshman year we went down to the Oak and Bucket game down in Bloomington and I don't even remember whether we won or lost, but I know that they attacked Purdue Pete. It was Ron Chalfant and took his head and stole the hammer and smashed the head and I decided right then and there that I wanted to be a part of taking care of that and, uh, and we never did anything more about that other than just holler and scream. But, and, uh, as I went through the fraternity, as I said, the Purdue Pete was in that fraternity, and when I was a sophomore, Pete Chalfant was Purdue Pete, and his wife had a premature baby and was in the hospital in Attica, so he would spend every minute that he could with her and the baby in the hospital, which was usually on weekends. So I actually got to do Purdue Pete, you know, in his place and enjoyed it. And then my junior year, my big brother in the fraternity, Randy Cates, was Purdue Pete. And he was on the judging team. And all of their events were on weekends. They'd go away to judging contests and stuff. So... <laughs> once again I ended up doing it several times for him and uh, there used to be a spirit committee or whatever it was um, and they actually interviewed people so when I went in for my interview at the end of my junior year I told them you know I've done this for two years I'd really like the opportunity to have my name on the and I was selected as Purdue Pete and I enjoyed it. I It wasn't the only thing I did while I was here. I was uh, on the um, yearbook staff, the debris, which is no longer. Um, but I was pretty proud. Our junior year, we put out a yearbook that won a national award. And very proud of that. Um, How... Can you describe 
since we're on that topic, could you, you describe the process of, of creating a degree yearbook? I don't think we've ever had anybody uh, talk about that. It was, um, well, I'd also done that in high school, so I was interested in it, and one of the first things I did when I came on campus was I went to the office, and it turned out that I had a very good friend that was already working there. And um, literally in those days, you had basically uh, four or five carbon copy prints that you drew the outline of the book and everything. And of course, the debris was about a 500 page thing, so you can imagine how much. And uh, being on the junior staff my freshman and sophomore years, I literally drew about 80% of the pages. The editors for each different area, like sports, um, you had somebody for residence halls, you had somebody for fraternities, you had somebody for activities. Um, but they would submit their, what they did in their portion, and then it was up to me to make sure that it was correctly drawn up and you had people that had to go out and identify everybody in the pictures and it was a lot of work but it was you either enjoyed it or you didn't do it and I would say I've told people that my four years at Purdue I participated more in the debris and being Purdue Pete on weekends you know than um, than I really did. I, I got more out of college from the people I met because being on the yearbook I interacted with everybody and I knew a lot of the, uh, the uh, faculty. Um, because I had been on the yearbook staff and had talked to people, I remember when uh, summer camp of 74 in ROTC, I was in Fort Riley, Kansas and Dean Stone, Beverly Stone was the Dean of Students then. She came out to visit us because there was like eight or ten of us that had gone to summer camp that year. But because she was familiar with me, she actually asked me to be her person, went around with her and told her what was going on and everything. So I, uh, I feel like participating in the different act activities, being Purdue Pete, you knew everybody in the sports area, being on the yearbook, I knew a lot of the faculty and everything, and actually I uh, coordinated a pig roast with President Art Hansen. We cooked a pig in his backyard my senior year. I, I really enjoyed my four years here at Purdue. Yeah. I, so um, where, uh, can you describe uh, the Purdue Pete that you were involved in, the, the costume? You know, what it was made out of and, and who made it and, and so on? Well, like I say, it, it had been pretty well destroyed my freshman year. And uh, I don't, because it had been in our fraternity, I'm pretty sure the one that I wore, our fraternity house burnt down the summer after <laughs> I graduated. And I think it was probably still in the closet upstairs. But it was, uh, I would say, stood three and a half feet, maybe tall, and was probably, oh, at, at least a good 30 inches across, and it was huge, you know. It was paper mache, I'd say it weighed, oh, uh, between 35 and 40 pounds, it, it chicken wire with paper mache on it, and uh, fiberglass, and I had one of the biggest sets of shoulder pads that I'd ever seen. Of course, we I didn't play football, but they seemed pretty massive to me. And then um, a huge black sweater that probably weighed, oh, I'd say 15 to 20 pounds because it had to fit over, cover up the, the neck of the head, plus cover those shoulder pads. And I'm not big, I'm 6'1", but... Uh, takes a pretty good size sweater and when you'd go into a basketball game you could lose a couple of pounds over the course of the evening 
and uh, I usually wore a pair of white pants and a pair of tennis shoes just so you could get around. It um, the Purdue Peach now, when you look at the new, the younger ones. Well, for one, they've got four or five of them. They take turns going out and do things, whereas. And I, we didn't do things like they do now. I mean, they literally go out and you can have Purdue Pete come to your birthday party and uh, you can have Purdue Pete do this and do that. Well, they have several people that can cover all the bases. When Purdue Pete had to do something when I was in school, there was only one. So you, I did uh, the local television show or television station around here. I remember I went out several times. They had a children's program and the kids wanted to interview, interview Purdue Pete. That was a lot of fun. Um, I, I did do it, not in any f official capacity, but uh, friends of mine, you know, that knew who I was and everything, I did do a couple of birthday parties, but it was more because I had the Purdue Pete head in the back of my car, so we'd drive down. There was one down in Sullivan, Indiana I did. And I had a lot of fun. I, I just, it was my opportunity. I had, like I said, I participated in sports, and being Purdue Pete was my chance to get back out on the field because, you know, I wasn't big enough to play football, wasn't, couldn't compete with them in basketball and and you know I just it was my opportunity to shine even though I was hidden underneath the head um, did you look out the mouth yeah the that's what we did then you and that yeah. wasn't a very good view yeah. you <laughs> and what was the hammer made out of it was wood um, it was probably I'd say the the handle was about three feet and uh, the size of a small shoebox, the head, or you know, the hammer part. And you kind of tried to stay away from people because, like, I, you couldn't see. <laughs> You'd go out there with the cheerleaders, but you didn't want to interact too much because you literally, you know, <laughs> it was these guys now, they can go out and dance and they go out and do this and they do that. And I tried to stand up, you know, stand, <laughs> keep from falling down. But uh, I remember in uh, Michigan, we went to Michigan for a football game. And of course we got beat 51 to nothing. And it was about five degrees below zero. You were glad you had that big sweater on, but that still was a very unpleasant place to be. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. Uh, so you uh, did football games and you did basketball games and, and, uh, and birthday parties and, and that sort of thing. Several times, yeah. Yeah, and, and um, what were people's reaction to, to Purdue Pete? People are, are really um, very much like it is now. I mean, I still have season tickets for the football game. I don't get to come to very many, but Purdue Pete will come through the crowd and the kids want a high five and and any Purdue alum, Purdue fan, they're very respectful. Um, I've never had any problem with any, but well, they, you know, the only problem is usually when the, the other side thinks it's fun to try and kidnap the mascot, but Purdue people, the fans, like I say, they they are very respectful of the mascot. They appreciate that he interacts with them. And, um, I've told them now. These I've met several of the younger ones, and they enjoy it. They they appreciate it. We all kind of respect the fact of who we were because we did represent the university uh, in our own small way, I guess. But um, there'd always be people who want to take your picture, 
be have their picture taken with you and and stuff like that. You did what you could, and then you also tried not to stand in the way of the people who were trying to watch the ball game. <laughs> so, you but had a I, large presence there, right? <laughs> yeah, when you're, uh, you know, Mackey Arena is is a wonderful place, but if you stand down in the corner, the people on the first two or three rows with that head that I used to have, I was, uh, I could be part of the, <laughs> part of the landscape and, you know, but I was one that could be moved. Uh, an interesting thing, I've told the story a couple times, and my, the very first time I did it um, was my sophomore year, and it was for Chalfin, or I mean for Pete, and um, Bodine. The ball game was televised. I think it was Illinois, I'm not sure. But uh, but anyway, after the game was over, I called my parents and I said, did you watch the ball game tonight? And they said, yeah. And Dad says, you were the mascot, weren't you? And I said, uh, yeah, that's what I was calling to tell you. And I don't know whether he'd seen me without my head on or what, but anyway, he told me he could recognize my hands and he knew it was me. And I've always thought that was <laughs> pretty amazing. But uh, it's what I did while I was here at the university. I mean, I, I did lots of stuff, but it's what I remember, that and the debris. So uh, you talked about um, being in ROTC. What was what was that like as far as uh, a year, you know, like um, the activities over the course of the school year? And then you went to uh, training camp in the summer, is that correct? Well, we, uh, the ROTC program, I'm, I'm not even sure what it is now, but I got a four-year scholarship, which meant I started ROTC, which we had to enlist in the uh, reserves as a freshman and you just went to classes but you went to classes like you know writing op or, or op orders and military history and tactics and I had uh, very good instructors I mean you and I are similar age or close and uh, when we were here I was in the very last uh, draft and the reason I took the scholarship I had tried to get into West Point and was told by the congressman that he wouldn't give me the appointment but he would get me into the prep school and well high school was a pretty big thing and we had a pretty good basketball team so I turned down the prep school but I got the four-year scholarship to ROTC in the next to the last draft, my number had been somewhere in the 20s. So when I got the scholarship, I said, yes, sir, I will take that scholarship. And it afforded me the choice to go anywhere I wanted to go. Uh, tuition nowadays is not that, it's so much more than what it used to be. I figured my scholarship was worth $100 a mile because I lived eight miles outside of Indiana and out-of-state tuition was $800 more a semester than in-state. That's negligible to what it is now, but that scholarship was a big thing and it was a big reason why I came here. Really, what we did, um, again, it was the people I associated with in the ROTC. There was a staff sergeant that was very he in instructed me more on how to deal with my troops and uh, of course the war ended and I spent three years in Colorado Springs which was not a bad place to have to play army if that's what you want to do and I got to dry or you know got to be a tank commander or had a platoon full of tanks 
I wanted to be a helicopter pilot, and I actually got my private pilot's license through the ROTC program here at school. But helicopter pilots had a life expectancy of about four days <laughs> during the war. So when the war ended, they had all kinds of pilots trained, and I never got to achieve my helicopter status or whatever, but then I also, I didn't have to go to Vietnam, and the army I served in was a lot different than the army of a lot of the people my age or older, but um, it, ROTC paid for my education, and ROTC my activities on the debris and being Purdue Pete pretty much defines my four years at Purdue University. Um, wh what was your major? Well, I started out in engineering, but I, uh, and it <laughs> was an interesting thing too. The second semester, we went in for an orientation, and the professor up in front said, the, you engineering students, said, I know a lot of you are very uh, eager to get into the field and all that, but he said, I'll just tell you right now, two out of every three of you are probably not going to make it because Purdue University is a highly respected engineering university, and, you know, some of you are just not going to make it. Well, I just turned to the two people on either side of me and I said, you guys got a better chance because I'm transferring. <laughs> and I actually graduated with a um, physical education, you know, high school athlete. Everybody wants or thinks they can be a coach. And I graduated HSSE. I have a um, Bachelor of Physical Education with a non-teaching option. And because I was ROTC and the military said, we've paid for four years, he's graduating, he has enough credits, my minor is actually in military science because you had to have a professional minor to get the BPE non-teaching option because I never did my professional semester. But yeah, I, I have a very unique degree. <laughs> and what... What are you, you so you lived in the fraternity house, right? And, and which yeah. is no longer, right? which has been rebuilt. Oh, I mean, yeah. we uh, we had uh, some outstanding individuals. I have to say, we had one who literally went out and raised seven million dollars to do a remodel of our fraternity house, which we were very proud. We had the last frame fraternity building on campus. You look around, everything in Purdue University is red brick, which I think makes very nice, but it also made our fraternity house stand out. Well, it's I think it was over the 4th of July weekend that the renovations were about half done and a fire started and being on the weekend, being on the holiday weekend, nobody was around and we now have a red brick <laughs> fraternity house which I refer to as a hotel because it's not my fraternity house anymore. It's it's where my fraternity is stays, but it's that's not my fraternity house anymore. But I'm still proud to be in Alpha Gamma Rho. Okay. Um I want to get back to uh, the uh, debris in your book. Um, I was just thinking about you know, can you go over the like everybody that was involved, the photographers and everything else were students, correct? And um, can you go over like the the, the entire process? Of, you know, you know when did it, you start designing and making copy and, and all that sort of stuff. And what, what's the whole procedure? <coughs> at the end of the year, the book always came out right at the end of the year. 
so the seniors, graduating seniors, could get their books. So the existing senior staff, which was the editor-in-chief, the managing editor, the business manager, uh, there was a photo editor. I was actually the layout editor, which was the nuts and bolts. And then you had a junior staff, which was more or less everybody's assistants and then all the people that did the work. Um, once they chose the new editor, and then he selected, or he or she selected their new senior staff, you would spend, oh, the first, once you came back to school in the fall, you started immediately. You would start scheduling, and we had, I think at the time we had like four staff photographers, people who literally, you know, that was what they did. They took pictures. Um, Bob Dittis was our editor-in-chief, and I think he lived in the <laughs> pretty office down there. I know I spent a lot of time there. But you would start from the very beginning of school. You'd start scheduling the residence halls to get their pictures, you know, people that wanted their pictures. You had to deal with the students. You would schedule the seniors to start coming in and, and having their picture taken so you could have them in the book. It's, um, and you worked, it, it literally was a full-time job for somebody. I mean, you know, it, we all worked together. You did it students, and it's like everybody now, you know. They, uh, they've got their studies, but then they've also got their ac outside activities that you managed to find time to do. But once they took the pictures, and it would be our people took the pictures, and we printed the pictures down in the basement. We uh, processed the film. Is Stewart Center? Stewart Center, the basement. The sign is still up above yeah. the door. Mm -hmm. uh, you come down the stairway on the east end of the building, and it's the first door. And we used to come through the tunnel, and the... Um, Oh, the student newspaper, uh, Exponent. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a uh, rivalry. We, but then on uh, weekends when we were putting the book together and they were putting the paper together, we'd get together and have a pizza or, you know, just more or less. It was a good time. I mean, it's, it's just what you did. It was hard work, but it was a good time. Um, and back then... We had, like, one section. The first section had to be turned in. We came back to school the uh, 1st of September. And I think, actually, by the time I graduated, I think we were starting the last week of August. But you had that first month, maybe the first 45 days, and you had to have 20% uh, of the book ready to go because we... We would draw it out, lay out the pictures, crop the pictures, identify the copy, and identify the people, and then you sent that off to, uh, actually it was Taylor Publishing, I think, at the time. And I know now, even high school yearbooks, you do it on a computer. You do it in-house. Uh, you may draw it all up and then send that off to somebody who actually puts the book together, but you've got it on your computer in the high school, whereas, like I said, we had uh, carbon, like five or six copies that we would draw out, and we would take out our copy and save that, and then we'd send the pictures and everything off, and you didn't know what it was going to turn out until, you know, the publisher sent it back. And then you had just a series of deadlines, you had to have uh, the residence halls usually were the easiest because you'd schedule them just as soon as they came back because usually the residence halls were filled with a lot of freshmen and they all wanted their picture taken. They were going to Purdue University and then you'd go to the residence or the fraternities and they were usually 
easy to schedule because you know they had their people they wanted to make sure they were represented so you had those kind of pictures and those kind of things but then you also had sports that would spend so many pages on football so many pages on baseball so many pages on basketball that you went over the each one had a few pages in each deadline and then we had a, an opening section and an end section that literally were the the art people took care of those but then again you know I had to draw up each page and make sure it fit and all of that it it was really a learning process and I enjoyed it I had chosen to go to the military but I could have easily gotten back into well I wasn't really a journalist I was more of the nuts and bolts guy but I knew what I was doing when I was putting it together um, okay uh, let's go back to your ROTC days what was your uh, when when uh, you know during the summer you went to to a uh, an army base for or a National Guard base for training. Well, we what, just what went. Was that, what was that like, or what was it, how long did it take? Or? We just went, you went to summer camp between your junior and senior year. Oh, okay. I mean, basically, the your military science classes were three hour classes. So by the time you went three hours a week through the semester, you had fulfilled your obligation, like guys that are in the guard or the reserves now they go one weekend a month they got to put in so many hours well we did that over the period of the thing but then between your junior and senior year Purdue University and most of the Big Ten universities sent their cadets to uh, Fort Riley Kansas and there you know we were all budding second lieutenants at that time we were uh, almost there and you qualified with a rifle you qualified with your weapons you uh, did training um, I remember I was in because I was wanting to be a pilot I my biggest thing I did in the in the summer camp was I was in charge of an air assault landing you know uh, which was you were doing exactly what you were would be doing had we been somewhere where you were in combat except we weren't you know if we <laughs> we didn't have any any worry about that but we we treated it as a you know I did anyway because I wanted if I had had to have gone, I would have wanted to be training the way I would react had I been in a hostile environment. That's the way I looked at it. A lot of the guys, I remember some of the guys that had been in ROTC in high school, and when we'd go out, we used to go out in the, the woods here somewhere around Purdue, and the seniors, in ROTC would be the assault troops and we would be doing this and when they'd start shooting at us I'd flat on the ground <laughs> I knew they were blanks but you were supposed to be reacting like you would my god if I thought somebody was shooting at me but those guys all wanted to gung-ho and they would run towards the assault team and I'm, I looked at my instructor I remember and I said is that which one of us are right here <laughs> you know do you do you get up and run where you know the trouble's coming from or do you try and reassess the situation and and uh, and I I was uh, I got I got to say I was I was well prepared for what I did when we got out into the military world but when I was younger, I was disappointed that I didn't get to participate 
any more than I did, but as I've grown older, I appreciate the fact that uh, I got to spend my time where I did, when I did, and uh, once again, I made a lot of good friends in the military, and most of them are still around because that was the time of year we, or time of, time of our life and the time of world history, that it was fairly peaceful. So, uh, so you, you went into the Army what year? I, I started here in, in uh, September of 1971 and graduated in May of 75. And the official end of the Vietnam War is the 7th of May, 1975. And I was commissioned on the 17th of May, 1975. So. Nixon had brought them all home, and the war was over, and there was still a lot of hard times. I mean, there's still, I've got friends now that still have problems remembering Vietnam, and the first couple of years when I was home, when I got out of the service, I really thought the peacetime army was boring because all you did was go out and play Army just like we've done here. But as I've grown older and as I've had more interaction with people who actually went overseas, I begin to appreciate what, how my, my time in the military suited me and I, I appreciate what they did. And I was willing to volunteer, but I, I, I wasn't asked. Oh, one last uh, question, and that is, one of the things that the, the students that uh, I deal with here are intrigued about uh, student traditions, and you know, Purdue P is, uh, is obviously one of those. Uh, the cords were gone by the time you were. Uh, in s school, is that correct? That's correct. And and the pots, they were, yep. they were all gone. Um, the well, uh, the, um, like the gimlets, mm -hmm. they had. Okay, the gimlets and the reamers still kept there. They had, yeah, they had that, and like you say, they, but it was on the way out. Um, I just driving into Lafayette anymore, West Lafayette. We used to come, you know, like over the hill there at West Point, and you could see the smokestack. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, at that time, Purdue University produced its own electricity and heated a lot of the buildings with the boiler in that building and all. That kind of tradition, that that kind of stuff I miss when I come back to the university. Um, when I came to Purdue, the campus was, and it's still beautiful, but I get lost walking around now because the open spaces that used to be there where we would go out and throw frisbees or, you know, just hang out, study, laying on the grass, those spaces are shrinking, but there's also a lot more opportunity. Um, <laughs> my chemistry building was a temporary building that was built in 1945 or maybe 43 and that was where my chem lab was and they have a wonderful facility down there now you know four stories uh, Neil Armstrong whatever I have uh, a good friend whose son graduated from here and they have a building where he built a house inside, you know, and that building wasn't even there when I was there. Um, student traditions are what they are, and these students do things different than we did. Um, one of my things that I remember was a speech class that I took my freshman year. People from all different, you know, areas of the study were in that 
25 people that took that speech class. The week I graduated, I sat down with 10 or 12 of those people that we had seen each other. You know, Purdue University, when you compare it to the University of Illinois or Ohio State University, we were a very small community as compared to what it has grown to now. I mean, um, I, I am still proud of Purdue University. And, but, you know, I, I enjoyed the smaller community when we came here because actually my best friend and I, George Rogers and I, we were set up to go to the University of Illinois. And we both got our OTC scholarships. He elected to drop his and his parents could afford to pay his way, but we still came here. And I have told people over and over and over, the books, I didn't let the books get in the way of my education here. I, I interacted with people across the spectrum and I was very lucky that a lot of the alums in my fraternity were professors, like in the ag school. So we knew them and we would have them come back and tell us about the old days, about the traditions that they had, and how it had changed from then till when we were here, and now we're sitting here 40 years after I got out, and the traditions now are a lot different than what they were then. And I think that's the way it ought to be. So when you were here, uh, you know, the Grand Prix was going on, and uh, was that, uh, and, and then there was, uh, was the New Olympics going on when you were here? Oh, they had those, yeah, in Kerry Quad. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, <laughs> what about the burning of Miss Indiana, or was that earlier? Mm, I don't, I don't remember that. Okay. But I well, do what, remember that. Well, can you that. tell me about some of those that, you, uh, that were around when you were? Well, and we knew about it, mm -hmm. but Kerry Quad was pretty much its own little, um, thing. You either were a carry person or you weren't. And um, <laughs> the Grand Prix, now being in a fraternity, they encouraged participation in activities, which the Purdue Student Union Board, the Grand Prix Board, uh, we had members of the fraternity that, as I was on the debris staff, there was people who were on the uh, Grand Prix, and that that was probably the biggest springtime occurrence. Whatever you teamed up with a sorority or two residence halls got together, and you had a cart, and you you just went over there. It was a big race, big weekend. Um, one of the people that was I was in the fraternity with. Either the year we were seniors or shortly after, they started a tractor pull that I think went for several years. Um, another thing was there used to be a uh, what they called the Purdue Royal, and it was mostly ag students, but it could be anybody because, face it, Purdue University is pretty much an ag-related school. and. Everybody could go out and pick out an animal, and they showed it like you did in a in a county fair, which was a large majority of the people that come to Purdue University are ag students or ag related before they came. And then they had a uh, I don't even think they do it anymore because I think they had a uh, disease, you know, like hog collar or something that pretty much wiped out the. Uh, Ag facility for a while, and I don't, I don't know that they even do that anymore. But okay. anything else you'd like to talk about, or you know, I'm proud of being a Purdue alum. I uh, get a lot of smoke about it back home, being from Illinois. But uh, 
we won the football game this year, so I don't take too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I guess I'm supposed to say that, uh, again, my name is David Hubdy, and, uh, and I'm interviewing uh, Jim Jenis, uh, and this is November 16th, 2016. And thank you very much for, uh, for uh, doing this interview. And, uh, thank you for the opportunity. A lot of, a lot of new information. <laughs> Thanks.